speakpipe.com we got quite a few viewer voice messages in the queue we've got i mean looks like like 12 or something so we're gonna rip through all these make sure ladies and gentlemen if you want to have your voice heard on this channel in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people go to speakpipe.com there's a link in the description of every single video you can call in 24 7 you have 90 seconds to give me your best take thoughts whatever uh so feel free to use that let's go ahead and start with the one and only michael hi james my name is michael my question to you is what are the positives that we can look at before tough games like the cowboys or the chiefs that gives us like a slight edge over that other team that could be you know a super bowl bound team like what what could we look at every week that gives us like okay a sigh of relief that we still have this weapon this coach like what can we always look at that gives us an edge well you uh, if, if you had asked me this question three weeks ago i would have said the system i would have said you can look at the system you can look at how we try and do things like even after the loss against the falcons you know you're looking at that game you're like yeah i can see the vision i can see how we are trying to move the football i can see how we are attacking this i can see what we want to do and as long as you have a clear vision usually if you have the horses then you know you can win any game and if you can win any game then all you gotta do is try and get in the playoffs the dolphins are a great example where even if the dolphins lose when they're fully healthy you can really easily identify like what they're trying to do you can easily identify their way to victory and when they're hurt like it's obviously a completely different story but when they are rolling it's like all right yeah i mean if, if it's if you're a dolphins fan you're thinking we can take on anybody and we have a chance will we win you don't know about that but it's very different than if you watch a team like the patriots right now you watch them you're like i can't tell what they're trying to do you know like they're just kind of haphazardly running the ball they're throwing for like two yards an attempt like this is just a mismatch i see no line of victory so usually good teams you can find and identify the line of victory pretty easily right now for the saints it's hard to tell i mean right now with the saints it's hard to tell because we're so injured it seems to have devastated that system uh, very similar to the dolphins actually where if you watch the dolphins it's like this is nothing like this is this isn't even a full team you know like I mean, I think we can all agree it'd be crazy to watch the Dolphins since Tua got hurt and be like, man, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. For some reason, they seem to be kind of lost on offense. Like, well, yeah, I mean, their whole, like, it's all gone. And that's kind of where the Saints are right now. Right now, the Saints are just kind of lost offensively. So um, we'll see what happens against Tampa. We'll see if Rattler can give us a little bit more um, something, something special. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is a game to game, week to week thing. It, it really is. But fully healthy i think you can look at the saints and say there is a clear vision there we do have playmakers we do have people who can impact the game both offensively and defensively um you know right right now we just have to get healthy because right now we're we're not even playing like a playoff team much less a super bowl team much less like top tier so right now we just gotta get healthy but i appreciate the call my man uh Dwayne, you're up next all right james I'm DJ Dwayne, call me what you want. So, what I don't understand is, why is there a lack of runs to Taliese Fuaga side, you know? And why does, um, you know, we have wide receiver one who I clearly think can dominate, you know what I'm saying? I feel like he should dominate the target share. Why yeah. is she, he getting all the panic throws, all the third and long throws? Well, like, 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 even the pass with Mason Tipton. Why is Mason Tipton getting that route? Why is Chris Olave not getting that route? What, like, I don't understand why these routes aren't going to your best player outside of Alvin Kamara as a as a skilled person. Please help me understand. No, I'm with you. Uh, 100%. I'm with you, and I said the same thing in my recap of the video. I, I just, I mean, a recap of the game, I think came out came out on Wednesday, I believe. I, I just don't, I don't know. And I, and I think, I think the Sheed thing, I think Carr's like panic button is to just throw it deep to Rashid because it has yielded some success this year. The like deep ball or even last year, you know, the win against Tennessee. The problem is one, the problem is that Carr is drastically under throwing most of these balls. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the balls in the Kansas City game, they're under thrown. 
is that because of pressure? Is that because, I, I don't know. Like we we don't have to get into all that. But like the play he, the third and eight that he threw before he got hurt, before the Tipton play, that ball's underthrown and there's no pressure. So, you know, the second problem is that Rashid isn't really that guy. Rashid is a deep threat, but he's a deep threat in the sense of like if he's open, like burn past the safeties, burn past your cornerback, make an uncontested play, just like in Kansas City. He is not a throw it up, and he, he'll go get it. He, he is not that. He's not Justin Jefferson. He's not Jamar Chase. Those are guys where, yeah, panic button, make something happen, throw it up to Justin Jefferson, he'll make a play. Rashid Shahid is not that at all. So I don't know if Carr is kind of mixing up like success with deep passes with that kind of outlet, but... I. I, I'm right there with you. Like it should be Chris Olave. Chris Olave is much more of the one-on-one contested catch. See if you can go get it. And the Mason Tipton thing it is kind of surprising because if that is what Carr wants, like if Carr needs that one-on-one kind of just guy to go up and there and make a play, I do have to wonder why At Perry isn't on the team because At Perry was that guy last year. I mean, granted he had 20 catches or whatever, so it's not like At Perry is a superstar, but if that's what he wants, like if that's what we need, then I don't think Mason Tipton is that guy. Rashid Shahid is not guy. Chris Olave is barely that guy, right? So I'm right there with you. I don't get it. And, you know, leading up to the Chiefs game, and this really frustrated me, and it still frustrates me, is that leading up to the Chiefs game, Kamara's target share had been, I mean, uh, Olave's target share had been going up. It was two the first game. It's a blowout, so whatever. Then I think he goes two, six. It's like two, six, eight, ten. And I'm thinking, okay, finally, like he's the number one, feed him, give him 10, 12 targets, and let's run, let's run it through him. And then it dropped down dramatically to one target from Carr, or two targets, one reception from Carr in the Kansas City game. How is that possible? So I, I'm right there with you. I'm just as confused. I don't have an answer for it. Uh, I think it'll change with Rattler. But, yeah, I think Carr's got that mixed up. Dre from Cali. What's up, James? Um, losing three straight sucks, but according True. to everybody, um, in the beginning of the season and all the predictions, we're right where we're supposed to be. True. Good point. Great point. Now, results wise, yeah, results wise, we are. Like, results-wise, yeah, we are right there where we want to be. Like, we, no one ever thought we were going to beat the Chiefs. We were an eight-point dog before the season. The only hesitancy I would give to that is that before the season, we were hoping to win eight, nine games. Ceiling was 10. After the first two games, all of a sudden, the ceiling is, like, two seed, three seed, 12 wins, you know, like this is a legitimate contender. Now we've dropped back down to that. Like, yeah, we are right where we wanted to be before the season, but is that where we actually belong? Like, does this team truly belong in the conversation of nine, win, 10, nine, win, eight, win, or should this team be in the 10, win, 11, win kind of world? It's hard to watch those first two weeks and not say that they have the talent to be 11, 12. So if you f- frame it like that, you kind of frame it like, well, they're actually kind of underperforming because they should have beat the Falcons. They should have beat the Eagles, or maybe not should have, but they should have beat the Falcons at least, definitely in that game. So the problem is now that we're in a razor's edge situation where if we lose to Tampa, if we lose to the Broncos, if we lose, to, if we lose I, I would say over the next six games, if we do anything worse than four and two, it's going to be very difficult for us to win the division. It's going to be very difficult for us to uh, go to the playoffs. You know, could we still win eight games? Yeah, but I, I just feel like that's not what this team is built to do. And it all it starts with Tampa. I mean, I'll tell you this right now: if we don't beat Tampa, it'll be very difficult for us to win the division. And all of a sudden, the Broncos game becomes must win. Because if you don't beat, if you lose to Tampa and the Broncos, and you're on a four game losing streak, or excuse me, at that point, a five game losing streak, 
you're you're battling just to be you're battling just to win nine games. Ugh, that's that's a, that's a, that's a tough look. Exactly where we're supposed to be. Two and three, maybe should have been even one and four because nobody expected us to beat Dallas. We're right. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to lose to Atlanta on the road. We're not supposed to, but like you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Anyways. Yes. Uh, say we do lose to Tampa at home. We got the Chargers and the we got the Broncos and the Chargers right after that. Or Chargers, Bron- I don't know what order, but we got those two teams. Broncos Thursday, then the Chargers. Right after that. So we're either four and four or five and three. Well, see, now that's part of the problem too. We were supposed to be favored against the Buccaneers, right? Like, like, like you said, we're not supposed to beat Atlanta in Atlanta. Okay, divisional games, you're supposed to give it to the home team, and we were three point favorites. But now we're three point dogs against the Bucks, so we're not supposed to beat the Bucks in the dome. If we lose to the Bucks in the dome, we'll be dogs against the Broncos. We're already dogs against the Chargers, so you can see this domino effect of like, yeah, we should beat the Bucks. Yeah, we should beat the Broncos. Yeah, we should beat the Chargers. But when you start looking at the level of play we've had and kind of this, all of a sudden it's like, well, damn. Now we're not supposed to beat the Bucks. Now we're not supposed to beat the Broncos. Now we're not supposed to beat the, the Chargers. And when you say, like right now we're two and three, if we lose to the uh, the Bucks and the Broncos, we're two and five. Then you've got the Chargers. You know, like it. We should be five and four after nine games. We should be all these things. But when you look at how everything's playing out, it's more and more like. Damn, all of a sudden, like, we're not supposed to win any of these games. Like, everything's kind of shifted. Now, a lot of that is just, like, market narrative and market noise. But the Saints do have to, they do have to kind of right everything. The, the ship right now is kind of, I don't want to say sinking, but it's taking on water. You got to bail out, and you have to get the ship back up. Or if you if you take on water for too long, like, the season's over. You know, we're kind of at that line where we really can't take on any more water. We got to beat Tampa. We got to beat Denver. If we don't if we don't win those two games, you're you're staring at you know, you're staring at 2 and 5, 2 and 6, 3 and 7. You're staring at those kind of records and you know, like I said, if you're 3 and 7 after 10 games, the season is sunk after 8 weeks. We're exactly where we need to be. We could probably be better than what we need to be. The season is not over. And after the after the game against the Chargers, the rest of our schedule, there's only like two or three games that we should lose. The rest of them are tops up toss ups and we should win. We're right where we're supposed to be. We're in a good spot to win the division. Or even not even just win the division. We can still get a wild card spot. Our division is not as bad as it normally is. We can our, our division's good. You're right about that. The NFC South is good. Still get a regular wild card. You're you're right about that. Like if we win ten games, we we could get a wild card spot for sure. But like I said, you gotta you gotta bail out the water. You, you can't get a wild card spot if you're two and five, two and six, right? So I agree a hundred percent with what you're saying. And the season is not over. But this Sunday and this Thursday, the season's on the line. Like the season is on the brink. Well, without winning the division. No, good call. You made a lot of good points there. I agree. Directionally, we're on the same page. Um, but some of that has flipped. Some of the, like, we should win these games. For example, looking looking like looking like into the season, we I gave us wins against Tampa Bay at home. I gave us an easy win against the Broncos. I gave us a win against even the Commanders. Well, the Commanders now are definitely going to be favored with the way that Jane Daniels is playing. The Giants, we should still beat them. The Broncos or the uh, Browns, we should still beat them. But Rams, you know, like those teams, the Packers, like. And then if we're losing to Tampa at home, we're we're certainly not going to be favored against them on the road. So we got to make sure those little those games that we should win, the Bucks at home, Broncos at home, Falcons at home, we do win those games. Good call, great call, good insight. Hey. Johannes, Johannes, you're up next. James, what's going on? I'm sending this from Oslo, Norway. Norway! Unbelievable! All the way from Norway. Unbelievable. A global channel. Love it, man. Un- un- unreal. That-, that warms 
that warms this old chunk of coal's heart. Across the pond. I've been a fan of this channel for a long time, and I like your perspective on things. I would like you to share your thoughts on what would happen if Dennis Allen and the Saints decided to part ways. What do you think the future would hold? Thank you. Love the channel. Un- unreal. I mean, that's that's so cool from Norway. Uh, wow. Okay. A- awesome. Thank you very much. I mean, if the Saints fire Allen, what would happen is the first question would be, do you keep Kubiak in the offensive staff? If you say yes, so it's kind of like a, it's kind of like one of those decision trees, if you're familiar with game theory at all. Um, so the first part of the decision tree is, do you stick with the offensive staff? Let's just say yes. Okay, the next decision tree is, all right, well, you need to, f- to fill your defensive coordinator position. You are going to fire the entire defensive staff if you're firing Allen. You also need to fill that potentially with a head coach. So then you say, okay, well, is there a guy who can take over the defense and be a head coach? First one that comes to mind for me is Mike Vrabel. All right, you look at Vrabel, you think about, yeah, all right, Vrabel's a culture setter. He could reset the culture, reset the locker room. Um, He could also handle the defense. He may be the DC or he may hire a DC, but still, that's fine. So that's probably a route you would go. Someone like Mike Vrabel, Bill Belichick, also very similar. Bill Belichick defensive guy um he also belichick does want some like gm type responsibilities and he does want more of like a president of football operations kind of thing so i doubt that would work with loomis but i guess the question before all that would be do you promote kubiak to head coach which i don't think you would do because if you're firing allen the team probably isn't very successful and so you probably want like a new culture you want something different in there so i doubt kubiak would get the promotion i think he would just keep his job you could also think, okay, do we bring in somebody like John Gruden? John Gruden is more of an offensive guy. He is potentially, the game has kind of passed him by, so maybe he's less like X's and O's offensive guy and more of just the culture. So maybe he comes in, how does he feel about merging his system with Kubiak's system? Or you know, how, how does that play out? And then, of course, he would hire a defensive coordinator. But... I think the easiest thing to do, if it was me, if I was in the front office, is I would fire Allen and I would go get Mike Vrabel. I like Mike Vrabel a lot. I think he's a great great coach. I think he's a fantastic culture guy, fantastic locker room guy. I think he would bring a lot to um I think he would bring a lot to the Saints. I, I would love if Vrabel was the head coach. Uh you know, what, what however he wants to do the defense and then let Kubiak continue offensively. But I think what you don't want to do is repeat it. You don't want to be like, I've seen a lot of people say like fire Allen and hire Spags. Spags and Allen are the exact same person. It's two guys who are failed head coaches who are really good coordinators and that's it. So I don't want that. I don't want that at all. You have to get a head coach. You've got to get someone who you know can do man management, who you know can be a culture setter, a locker room leader. You got to have that. It ha- you have to make sure whoever you get is that. Like D'Amico Ryans, D'Amico Ryans is a head coach, okay, even though he was a DC. He's a head coach, tried and true. Alan Spaggs, people like that, they're coordinators. They're just coordinators. So uh, but that, that's how it would play out. And and my my first my first thought would be would be Vrabel. I would love to see Mike Vrabel get a chance. But I mean we you know since Katrina, there's been one voice in the locker room. That's Sean Payton. And Allen, obviously, he has been the other voice, but it's not been successful. So there might there might just need to beat that. Jesus. Y'all hear that hot rod going down Canal Street? Jesus. There might just need to be that cultural reset of, you know, a tried and true head coach coming in. But uh, thank you very much for the call. I really, really appreciate it. All the way from Norway. That's so cool, man. I hope you, uh, hope you call in again. CJ. Maxed it out. CJ goes 90 seconds strong. Here we go. I literally don't get why Kubiak is having Derek Carr throw to Mason Tipton. That doesn't make any sense. Why is Mason Tipton even on the field? He's not your playmaker. Yeah, I mean, you wonder you wonder whose decision that is. You know, like, for, I mean, I'll give him this. He was open. I'll give him this. Like, the ball was in his arms. But I do agree with you where it's like, can we seriously 
call ourselves a playoff team if Mason Tipton is the one getting the ball thrown to him in a must much you know must have moment. Get him away from the field. Get him off the field. Don't want to see him because why are we not throwing it to Olave? Olave is your wide receiver one for a reason, and you're only getting him one catch at the half at the first half. That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. But literally does not make sense. Why are we also throwing to Rashid Shaheed so much as like he's this actual wide receiver too? He is not. He can't catch 50-50 balls. He can't. No. He's just not that type of wide receiver. I'm sorry. That's just not how that shit works. He's good for deep threats, jet sweeps, kick returning, punt returning, whatever else. But as wide receiver too? No. I don't know if this is a result of Taysom Hill being out. But if Kubiak can't figure it out, then I don't think he's going to have a job much longer. Yeah, I mean, I echo a lot of what you're saying, where it's like, hey, look, this ain't the, the Rashid Shahid 50-50 balls, the Mason Tipton five targets, like that's not going to work. We're not going to win that way. It's pretty obvious how we won the early on. It's pretty obvious of what makes our offense look the best. That's running the football successfully, which running it vertically straight up and down at a weak interior offensive line, like that, that's not the answer. We were running the ball successfully with the zone run scheme and tosses and all the creativity and all that. Is that all gone because of Taysom? I don't know, but uh, I definitely agree. Like we just kind of reverted to doing a bunch of stuff that isn't going to make us successful. You know, like stuff that when have we ever been successful when we're just running it straight up the middle or tossing 50, 50 balls to Rashid Shaheed. We should be, and you don't even see, like, we always talk about the 49ers, how they're kind of like a blueprint of what we want to be. When do you see Brock Purdy just hucking up 50-50 balls to, like, you know, Jawan Jennings? Like, that's not how the, the 49ers offense rolls. Like, they're trying to run the football. They throw those, like, short, intermediate, uh, really high-efficient routes that get a lot of yak. Uh, we, we've completely gone away from that. We've gone away from getting Alave the ball in space and getting Kamara the ball in space and, you know, play action and all that. So... Uh, no, I, I agree 100% with you right now. Because he needs to learn how to adjust with what he has and makes it, make it work. And I know he can make it work. But the problem is that he has it. And, th- again, he might not have a job. Also, what is going on with our defense? We have zero pass rush. Like, literally, I saw no pass rush barely ever. Like, and the field was wide open. I feel like we, we just ran away from playing man it, it was just atrocious. Our defense was getting more ran through than Miss B Nasty. Like, literally just non-existent. A big-ass gap. Big shouts to Miss B Nasty. God, no, CJ. That was a hell of a call. Good stuff, CJ. You might want to start a podcast, my friend. Uh, no, yeah, I'm with you. The defense has not been good. We've had a lot. We've had a high pressure rate, but we have not found success sacking the quarterback. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, Mahomes just completely ate us up. Yeah, the defense has been less than stellar, I think. I mean, if like we're supposed to be a top five defense. We're supposed to be top three, top five defense, arguably the best defense. We cannot – if we're an average defense, we're going to be an average team. Like, we need this defense to be balls to the wall, and that includes sacking the quarterback, getting after the quarterback, stuffing the run, you know, locked down on the outside – and it sounds like, well, that, that you, you want them to be good at everything? Yes, I just said I want them to be a top five defense, top three defense. That's what this is. And if we're not, then what is, what is Dennis Allen doing there? So, no, I'm with you. We, we, we are giving up. I mean, there's way too many games where I'm sitting here going, oh, wow, we gave up 6.8 yards per play. Oh, wow, we gave up seven yards per play. Like, that's not a good defense. And I tried to tell people after the Eagles game, because everyone was like, we didn't give up a touch. We didn't. They 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 didn't give up an offensive touchdown until the fourth quarter. And it's like, guys, we're giving up seven yards of play. Like that's not a good defensive performance. Yeah, high leverage situations, fourth down spots, red zone, sure, for some turnovers. But you don't you don't go out there and give up seven yards per play, and sit there and tell me it was a good defensive performance. Same against Atlanta, right? Atlanta. Okay, yeah, we didn't. We did not give up an offensive touchdown. Okay, we still gave up six point five or whatever it was yards of play. Can't happen. Like, that's not good enough. That's not going to work. And, you know, so the defense does have to be better for sure. James, what a name. So nice. Had to do it twice. James Yancey, one, two, three, coming at you. Uh, I mean, just starting to become a common trend with this Dennis Allen defense in this day and age with this personnel that we're going to give up big plays. We're going to 
leave a spot of the field uncovered. We're going to allow people to make catches and we just want to come up and tackle, which it works when you have that personnel to do that. But I mean, when you got no offense, Ty, I love Tyron, but Tyron's aging. He's a lot slower. Demario, you know what I'm saying? He's hurt. He's a lot slower. Pete does what he, Pete Werner is doing what he can, but I mean, he's not even as physical he was as he hurt. could be. He was out against KC. I mean, Kalen Saunders, shout out to him last game because he gave us a chance when yeah, nobody else true. could. True, true. Same with uh, Alante Taylor. Yep. I mean, Alante he came was out great. And played his ass off. Yep. Tried to do everything he could in his power to win that damn game. But do you look at guys like Orgy at, at the backer position? I mean, clearly, well, he's a he's not a starter, though. but at yeah, the same yeah. time, he's got to. There's got to be something there. He's an NFL player. There's no way he just doesn't know how to play zone over the middle. Yeah. There's no way he's dropping back 15, 20 yards when he's just guarding the middle of the field. I mean, these dudes were just getting off the line and scrimmage and cutting, and some of them even just stopped and were just standing there wide open. This D-line, I mean, this D-line is hit or miss every game. Sometimes they have a good get-off. Sometimes they don't. I just – Dennis Allen's got to do a better job preparing this team from number one on the depth chart all the way down to 54. I mean, they got to be ready. 100% agree there. I mean, 100% agree. A lot, of, a lot of what I said in the previous call – stands for that too but yeah i mean i i don't you know because i've i've kind of sat back and thought about that myself where even if you go back to the sean payton days with dennis allen as the dc we did seem to lose a lot of those like high leverage situations whether it was the minnesota miracle situation whether it was the overtime game against the vikings in the playoffs whether it was uh you know the tom brady buccaneers game whether it was uh, the Eagles marching down the field on third and 16, whether it was the Falcons marching down the field to kick the 58 yard field goal, whether it was the chiefs converting second and 34, like that seems like a lot of really individually like low chance things. But the fact that they all happen, like some of them happened three weeks in a row and the, and the whole, that whole group of them happened like every year for like seven or eight years straight. So I, my theory is that we play this like super high volatile, high risk, high reward kind of defense. And when the spotlight is on these players, so last play of the game, last drive of the game, last whatever, either they're getting flagged because it's a high pressure situation. So obviously the referees are more likely to throw the flag or they, something happens. And because it's such a high pressure situation, the like uh, if our defenders fall or if our defenders run into each other or if there's a defensive penalty or whatever it's much more severe so because it is kind of becoming kind of a trait of this defense where oh they have to make a even the nfc championship game yeah the no call happened but we still could have won the game if the defense stops them and they let jerry golf march right down the field and kick a field goal and go to overtime so we just see, we seemingly cannot get that last stop. We seemingly cannot like think about. We have the opportunity. Stop Atlanta. We win the game. We have the opportunity. Stop Philly. We win the game, and they, and they gave up both. I mean, even KC like second second and thirty four, second and thirty four, and you're supposed to be a top five defense, top three defense, and you give it up a week after giving up the game winning drive to Atlanta the week after giving up the game winning drive to Philadelphia. Like it is kind of a comedy of errors with his defense right now. James, you're up next. It might be the same guy. Um, and Clint Kubia. It is not. I don't think so. Yeah. No back to back James. So nice. Had to do it thrice. Back. I mean, I like, I like what he's bringing to the team. I think he is a good hire. I know he hasn't been super consistent, unfortunately, which bugs yep. me as well. I feel like that creativity from the first two weeks has gone. Yep, agree. I feel like having Shahid or Kamara in the backfield together for some of them sets could really open up some things matchup-wise. Yeah. I mean, you got Shahid and Kamara coming out the backfield. It's rare two backers are going to be able to guard that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with – like, like, oh, Oops. I, I agree with the whole idea of, like, what – where 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 is all this? Like, why aren't we running these plays? Why aren't we doing what we were – I showed a stat where it was like 50 – I think it was through the second week of the season, 52% of our snaps was play action. We ran four plays of play action against the Chiefs. I mean, 
it's easy for me to say, but I don't think you should be able, I don't think you should switch up your system that drastically because of some personnel, you know, moving around. I understand there's injuries. I understand that. But the idea that you completely abandon something, that just seems like the worst possible way to go. So I'm a little disappointed with Kubiak when it comes to like, I mean, our system can't be the system only when we're at full strength, only when things are perfect. You kind of have to, like, that's what we've seen with the teams like the Rams, the teams with the 49ers, where it's like, okay, well, McCaffrey's out. Guess what? Jordan Mason's going to do the exact same thing. We're not going to change what we're doing because McCaffrey's out. Oh, uh, blank players out for the Rams. Okay, guess what? Puka Naku is going to do exactly what Cooper Cup was supposed to do. Like, they don't really change. They don't really turn into a different team. We have turned into a totally different team the last couple of weeks philosophically. Versus just screens, getting Olave on some slants or something, on some drags across the field, utilizing the speed, utilizing their skill sets. We don't just have a wide receiver, a, a unnamed player that's just going to catch the ball and that's all he can do. I mean, like, it's like Olave doesn't even get the chance for, I mean, look, last game stats, we don't get run after catch chances. It's like we just get the people to spots, catch the ball, fall to the ground, catch the ball, yeah. go out of bounds. Well, that's exactly what was happening last year. And then the first two weeks, all of a sudden, we were getting a ton of yak. ton of yak. And we're sitting here like, yeah, okay. Exactly what I thought was going to happen. Now we've reverted. So you know, before the Chiefs game, I previewed the game, and I said the way I think we need to win is blank, blank, blank. Like, okay, run screens, get away from Chris Jones. Like, let's try and be quick. Let's try and do this. We did the complete opposite. So I'm not saying that I'm an offensive coordinator. I'm not saying that I'm – you know, always right, or that the, the Saints should hotwire me in to call plays. But if it's that drastically different, I, I do have questions of like, well, why? Why why did we not try and get Rashid Shahid the ball and with screens and just quick stuff? Why did we not try and get Olave involved at all? Why didn't we try and give Olave a chance on those like dig routes that were basically free the first couple of weeks? What why didn't we utilize Kamara in the screen game? Like why what why were we why did we just resort to 50-50 balls or Rashid Shaheed? Why did, we, why did we just resort to kind of running Alvin Kamara up the middle straight at Chris Jones? Like, how was what, – what am I missing here that led to that game plan for four straight quarters? We don't do anything to game plan and scheme our receivers open other than, play, other than the play action pass. Rarely do I see any misdirection, any picks going on on the field. And granted, part of that is the O-line, but part of that is just – the unwillingness to call plays like that and the unwillingness to deviate from what it seems to be a certain game plan that you have cooked up all week. We just got to know how to adapt on the fly. And I feel like in terms of offense, once we can start. Yeah. I mean, I I'm with you. Like when Taysom is not there, because when Taysom was on the field against Atlanta, it was the exact same thing like that. We saw the first two weeks, there was misdirection, there was motion, there was, I mean, some incredible design, like the Taysom Hill fourth and one fullback dive play. That was a beautiful design. When Taysom is not there, it completely goes away. So I, it does kind of seem like he goes into this with a game plan of like, oh, well, we don't have Taysom, so we've got these 20 plays to choose from and see what happens. But like I said, I mean, that just that cannot be it. That cannot be we, – we've seen this too many times now where like we've seen it in the Philly game – and we saw it in the KC game where it was a system or a game plan or however you want to phrase it that was not working at all. And there was really no creativity or no adapting or whatever. And it just, it was what it was, but that, that can't, I mean, if we see that against Tampa, because Tampa's built very similarly to Kansas city where they're going to be really good on the D line, especially the interior D line. So is Kubiak going to try and do the same thing he did against Kansas city? My God, I hope not. Or is he going to adjust? We'll see. And if he adjusts and, and we look better against Tampa, then my question is, why didn't we do that against Kansas City? Bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. You are next. Hello, James. I hope you're doing fine. I'm actually following you all the way from Norway. And one of the first oh, another, things... Another Norway call. What is the chance that we go two Norway callers, Bananas and Johannes? That is wild. Wait, I, I got to get to Norway. Someone comment, where do I need to go in Norway? Where, where, where's, a good, where's a good vacay spot? I need to get up to Norway, bring some merch. I do each morning. 
after coffee, of course, is seeing what videos you have posted during the night. I like your takes of glass half full instead of all this dooming going around. We got, I gotta hear it again. I gotta hear it again. Hello, James. I hope you're doing fine. I'm actually following you all the way from Norway, and one of the first things I do each morning, after coffee, of course, is seeing what videos you have posted during the night. Unbelievable. One of the first things he does, gets himself a cup of coffee, and then turns on the face of the franchise. Unbelievable. I like your takes of glass half full instead of all this dooming going around. You've actually become my go-to Saints guy, so I want you to keep up the good work. Yeah, we, yeah, 100%. Look, we just tell it like it is. Like, I'm, I'm not negative nor positive. I am, I am just strictly looking at what's in front of me, calling it like I see it, giving you my opinion, and it is what it is. You know, like, the numbers are the numbers. The game tape is the game tape. The All-22 is the All-22. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that something is great when it's bad. I'm not going to sit here and say something's bad when it's good. You know, like, that's just not how we do it, and that's not how I am as a fan. I, I don't get, I don't get overly emotional. I don't, I don't get overly, you know. I, I very rarely am I going to have a rage or rant video or whatever. I'm not going to create some superficial kind of thing just for views or clicks. So I'm glad you enjoy it because that's that's how this channel is going to operate. So just like I know I referenced it earlier, but just like the Philly game, just like the Atlanta game. Everyone was saying, like, the defense pitched a shutout. The defense was A-plus. The defense was this. And one of the first things we said on the on the recap was, like, yeah, the defense wasn't that great. Seven yards per play ain't going to cut it. You know, so, uh, yeah, we I, I would say we're originating a lot of the, you know, thoughts or whatever in the space. And so much I'm glad that that style of content works for you. I appreciate that. So my question is, is this. I just don't see DA surviving past this season. I don't see what he brings to the table anymore. He loses games he should have won. Yeah. The loss to the Chiefs was so... What happened? Bananas. What happened? Bananas. The loss to the Chiefs was so... Bananas. Bananas. What happened? Bananas. Something cut out. Something happened on in Norway. The loss to Chiefs was so. Oh, bananas. Sad. Oh, I agree, though. I agree. Oh, bananas. Call in again, man. Call in again. I agree. I think right now, Allen is on the cut line. He is on the, if this doesn't work out, because Allen is not a good head coach. Like we have, I have said that a zillion times. Situationally, he is not a good coach. That's why you see us lose those games like that we should have won, but we lost, like those expected win kind of things. That's why you see us losing those games because Allen is not that kind of guy. My argument was similar to like a Dan Campbell where Dan Campbell is not an offensive X's and O's guy, but he has Ben Johnson, right? Like Ben Johnson is that. So DA needed the offensive guy, which is Clint Kubiak. But... Like Dan Campbell's situation is he's a good culture guy, he's a good locker room guy, he's a good man manager, he's a good leader, whatever. He has like he's show he's obviously showing his benefit to being in the position he's in. DA's benefit is that he's traditionally been one of the, if not the best, defensive play caller in the NFL. So the idea is like, okay, if Allen's the head coach, but he's really the defensive coordinator and he has nothing to do with the offense, and Kubiak can be his form of the Ben Johnson. Maybe Kubiak and Janoko can kind of take over that situational stuff. Okay. Well, if you if the defense is not that good and the situational stuff is still bad, then and and you have locker room questions. Last year we had a ton of culture locker room questions. This year we're kind of getting to that point to where it's like, are there questions? I heard there were some disagreements between Hayner or Rattler. You know, so DA is certainly on that line right now of like, hey, what exactly are you doing here? Like, what exactly are you bringing to this team? It seems like right now, not much. So I think, I hate to put like a hard number on it, but I think if the defense is not in top eight or better, I think DA should be should be gone. 
That, that's how I'd put it. Jonathan, the main event. Hey there, James. Greetings from Tennessee. Uh, had Tennessee was uh, in Nashville last year. Uh, loved it. Uh, I, was, I was really kind of surprised, though, because Nashville, you always hear about how much of it's like a party town. But you can't even take drinks on the street. I'm so used to New Orleans. Like, I, I got a drink at a Jason Aldean's bar in Nashville, and it was in a plastic cup and everything. I went to walk out the door, and the guy was like, you got to finish that. I, I didn't even think about it. I didn't realize you couldn't drink on the street in Nashville. But I like Nashville. I like it a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a cool place. Tennessee's cool. Tennessee's a very cool, uh, very cool place. Like I said, I like Nashville. I uh, went to a Preds game, went to a John Mayer concert. Uh, so I definitely want to get back up to Nashville soon. Something bopping around in my head for about the last week and a half that I was hoping the face of the franchise could help set me straight. <sighs> Why does our offense fall apart without Taysom Hill? Short answer, I don't know. Long answer is I think it is, I think Taysom is that cog of the misdirection and the mismatch and the kind of, he is the piece. He's like the engine that when we're moving people around, when we're creating mismatches, it's it's off of Taysom. And it's easy to be like, oh, we'll just put Adam Prentice there. Or, oh, just put uh, Hooker there. Or, oh, just put whoever there. But they're not going to draw the same kind of... They're not going to draw the same kind of attention. So it might be one of those things where if he's not there, the whole kind of play falls apart. And if he's not there and the play falls apart, then you're not going to run the play. So then your playbook gets much shorter. I mean, like the most obvious example was in the Atlanta game on fourth and one, we called that like fullback dive to Taysom. Third and one, Taysom got a carry in the first drive that he converted the first down, even though he got stopped in the backfield. If you think about the Eagles game when he wasn't there, we had a lot of third and one, fourth and ones that we didn't convert. Remember Alvin Kamara had the fourth and one, I think it was where he had the, took the direct snap. That play is not happening if Taysom's in the game. There was the fourth and one where Alvin didn't get it right before the uh, the Eagles touchdown, where he's probably not getting that carry either. That's probably a Taysom play. So that's what it seems like to me, is that Kubiak has schemed this to where Taysom is like, he is the entirety of the play action, the misdirection, the movement, the mismatches and stuff like that. And the roster just isn't deep enough to have someone else in there that can do the same thing. I, I know he's an incredibly talented player and he can do so many great things. He can, <laughs> he can catch, he can run, he can throw, but we don't use him to throw anymore. If he lines yeah. up the quarterback. No, the throw is not. Yeah. He, he's the whole throwing part of the misdirection. Isn't even a thing anymore. It, it's strictly misdirection. As far as like, if he's in the backfield, the defense has to really account for him running the football if he's motioning, now they got to account for him catching the football. Whereas if like Adam Prentice is there, they really don't have to account for him running the football. Like if he gets the ball fine, but he's not as dangerous as Taysom. If he motions out, are they going to be that concerned about him catching a pass? Probably not. So it's more of that, but I, I do agree. Like the, the passing part is totally gone. It's an option. He's either going to hand it off or he's going to run it himself. Yeah. So what can he do beyond throwing the ball that Chris Olave? Rashid Shahid, I don't know, maybe Jordan Mims, any of those guys could do? I think it's exactly what we saw in the Philly game where they just don't, they're just not as good. At, like Chris Olave is not going to get the handoff on a fourth and one. Yeah. Third and one, you don't want Chris Olave getting that handoff. So then you got to step back and say, okay, well, who do you want getting the handoff? Alvin Kamara? Okay, well, what's the formation look like? Because you're just going to run a halfback lead, halfback dive, fourth and one? Like, what's that What's that all of a sudden become, right? So, same with, like, the, like, okay, put Adam Prentice back there. Okay, well, now you just created, like, your fourth your fourth and one play is now has now gone from this, like, misdirection, Taysom Hill, Alvin Kamara type thing to now you've dropped back to a traditional just, like, I form halfback dive. Because, like, they don't care if Adam Prentice gets the ball. If he gets it, okay. But is that what you want your fourth and one carry to be? Is Adam Prentice? It's not going to be Rashid Shahid. It's not going to, you know, like Jordan Mims, same thing. Like you want Jordan Mims to be the guy on fourth and one, third and one? No. So that's where Taysom, 
that's where he does kind of do he does do things that we that no one else on the roster can do certainly not at that level and you know just like i explained like if you're sitting in an i formation fourth and one and you have Taysom and alvin back there and out or like if Taysom motions in all of a sudden now you're thinking like Taysom could absolutely get this ball and if he gets the ball fourth and one like it's gonna be really hard to stop him or they could be used as a misdirection to alvin so he like i totally get it and i do agree like the whole offense shouldn't be totally built on Taysom hill but um i for what i can see that's why it does look so different it just feels like we're leaving a lot on the table for really no reason no uh, thanks see you. no problem man appreciate the call yeah i mean I, i'm right there with you like if Taysom is that important if he is that much of a key or a cog Go get another version of Taysom. Have two of them. He is not he is not the only person on the planet that can do this. No way. There, there's got to be someone else that can do something like what Taysom's doing. Have them on the roster. If if this like that's just roster building 101, really. If your offense is this important, like it's kind of crazy when you think about the Dolphins. I know I mentioned the Dolphins a couple times this video, but if their offense is so predicated on Tua's ability to throw like short, accurate passes, why the hell is Skylar Thompson their backup? Why isn't Joe Flacco their backup? Why didn't they go get a guy who they knew like, hey, if Tua go- does go down, this guy can do pretty much exactly what Tua does. He might not do it as well, but he can act- He can do it. Like The fact that we don't have anyone on the roster that can do what Taysom does if Taysom gets hurt kind of puts us in a vulnerable, vulnerable spot similar to how the Dolphins are an incredibly vulnerable spot because they have Tyler Huntley and Sky Thompson trying to do it too. It does like, why didn't they go get Mac Jones or why didn't they go get Joe Flacco or why didn't they go get somebody who could do what two does? It doesn't make any sense. So I think it's more of a roster building question than it is a, a system question, but I don't know. I mean, I, I watch a lot of BYU football and there's a lot of guys on BYU who it's like, man, they're kind of doing what Taysom's doing. So I don't know if we need to be scouting more of these guys in college who can kind of do multiple things and just keeping them on the roster. But yeah, I, I'm with you. Something has to change. Guys, great question. That was a lot of questions. That was, what was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine questions, two of which were from Norway. So Keep them coming uh, all weekend, game day, pregame, postgame, whenever. If you want to sound off, pop off, you got 90 seconds with the face of the franchise. Get in there, speakpipe.com. Thank you very much for the calls, and I will see you in the next video.